Welcome to the space and place of equipping here at Equipping Belief Ministries, where learners of his word become lovers of his way and doers of his will. Hallelujah. So we have got a jam-packed word for you all. And um, on Valentine's Day, no less, I mean, the message that that we're sharing here is, is just incredible and it's so timely, but that's just like God, right? To do the miraculous and to do the seemingly coincidental um, in such a amazing way. Um, so the word that I have for you today primarily is in First Chronicles 16, but God has given us a lot. So we're also gonna examine John 12, 37 through 50 and John 13 and we've got some supplemental scripture in 2nd Chronicles 20 so grab your Bibles open up your apps get comfortable we're getting ready to get into it all right here we go 1st Chronicles 16 now I want to preface this reading we're gonna take this in small chunks I'm gonna preface this reading with a little bit about this passage first chronicles 16 shows us the customs of lifting praises to our god and sharing worship and fellowship with believers in the old testament so essentially chapter 16 here and first chronicles is an example of how to do that and how to do it in a way that is pleasing to god so let's read. We're going to read the first three scriptures, uh, 1 Chronicles 16. And the word reads, They brought the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before God. After David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each Israelite man and woman. He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to make petition, to give thanks, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, Zechariah second, then Jael. Now I'm going to pause right here. I might, I might mess up these names, so y'all just... Y'all bear with me. Shemiroth, Jehiel, Matthiah, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed-Edom, and Jael. They were to play the lyres and harps. Asaph was to sound the cymbals. And Benaniah and Jeziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. And so we'll pause right there. Because in this scripture, in this, it, right on the out, excuse me, right on the onset, it's about the Ark of the Covenant of God, and all of this celebration and all of this praise is is performed within the presence of this Ark of the Covenant. And so, what is this? What is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, we know that the Ark of the Covenant is a physical representation of God in the Old Testament. And they ushered it into the tent, or what would be the tabernacle or the church or the place of worship, again, still in the Old Testament. They ushered that in first. So they ushered in the presence of God first. And the way that they did this uh, was with music and sharing of food and sacrificing so those are the customs okay and so why is that important why is it important this order of events this order of service well not only is it important because we serve a god who is a god of order but this order is the guard rail right that keeps them from idolatry um this order is everything in its perfect place to ensure that the acknowledgement, the recognition, the praise, and the worship was directed toward God himself. We know that in Revelations 1 through 8, God says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That's how he introduces himself. That is who he is. 
And so we are going to honor him and praise him. We have to, number one, recognize that and acknowledge that by the way that we structure our our activities and the things that we do for him in his name. Now, God also said in Exodus 23, uh, he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. And again, he's speaking to idolatry there. Now, gods, we understand it doesn't have to actually be a god, a said god. But anything that we are exalting above God becomes a god to us. Man, there are so many examples of, of, of what could qualify as a god. In this day and age we think about the news that we listen to the entertainment that we watch the places that we go the goals that we set the uh, motivations that we have you know our why for living even our children can become gods god is very adamant to to let us know what the standard for righteous living is and that is not exalting anything or anyone above him, above his name, above his will or his way, above his word, right? Those are all very important things to remember. And then as we're thinking of idolatry, let's also let's also acknowledge this his word in 1 Corinthians 10:7. The word says, "Do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. But we can see right away that there's nowhere in that scripture where the people, as it were, ever acknowledge God. So that is the reason for the order. And as we examine the first three verses of this scripture, it's important to bear in mind the order. You usher in the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. You, you set it in its rightful place within the church, the place of worship, the tent, the tabernacle, the body of Christ, the believers, right? You do all of this first. You, you, and then you, you, know, you share the blessing with the people, right? Okay. Now also in this section, we refer to burnt offerings and sacrifices. And I think that for most of us, we understand the purpose of a sacrifice, but I think that we understand it in a Levitical way. We may understand it in a transactional way, right? But let's get to the heart of what it is. So after the presence of God comes into the place of worship, comes among the body of, of worshipers, um, burnt offerings, and fellowship offerings, also called peace offerings, are bestowed and put at the altar of the Lord. Now, a burnt offering is, is the act um, or, or what you offer to atone for the sin of the offerer in order to gain God's acceptance. This was the custom of the times in the Old Testament. This was the way that they related to the God of the Old Testament, the Heavenly Father. These were the requirements of that relationship. Okay. Now, about these burnt offerings. Now, the, they always included a sacrifice, but it had to be the best sacrifice. It had to be a sacrifice of the highest quality of any of the animals, bulls, sheep or goat, or turtle doves or pigeons. So that is what they typically would sacrifice for burnt offerings. And it had to be the best of them all. And they would burn these animals and they would allow the flames to consume it entirely. And that was the, again, as we talk about customs, that's the appropriate way that you do it, right? And I think another thing that's important to note is that these burnt offerings were conducted on a semi-regular basis. So they pro they did it quite often. So if you think about if you think about commerce, if you think about um, earning wages and labor back in that time, people did it 
by raising livestock, growing crops, you know, and that is what they would, that's what they would trade. And of course, there would be some trade of a, you know, a shekel or two, some silver and gold, but primarily it was raising livestock, raising um, crops, vegetation, grains, and, and sharing those things, selling those things. That was the bedrock of their economy back in the day. So when you think about sacrifice, when you think about the requirement, according to this custom, that the sacrifice had to be the highest quality, excuse me, that the offering had to be the highest quality, right away you know, having that knowledge, of what these animals meant. They were giving their best. They were giving their livelihood. They were giving their nourishment. They were giving their, um, their means, right? Now, there were severe consequences if you offered a sacrifice that was not the best and We've seen this time and time again, seemingly with every generation. We've seen it with Cain and Abel. We learned about it with uh, Jacob and Esau. Um, so it's really important to make sure you give your best. Uh, but I like to look at it this way. They gave their best, yes, but they giving their best also meant that to some degree they went without. Hence, this is a sacrifice. And you had to do these things in order to gain God's acceptance. That's incredible. Let's go on to peace or fellowship offering. Now the peace or fellowship offering signifies the wholeness of the Israelites when they came together with God and worship. The word peace describes the wholeness and refers to the condition of acceptance. Okay. So... If you were raised in the church or uh, have any memories of going to the church service or, you know, you probably experienced coming in and having like co uh, coffee and donuts or staying after and sharing a meal. That's what the peace or fellowship offering was. It was the act of gathering together with believers, with those who who sought to be whole or to be one with God and witnessing the burnt offerings, participating in the burnt offerings, right? Giving of what you have and laying it on at the altar, giving the best of what you had and laying it at the altar and then worshiping, fellowshipping with others, um, eating, breaking bread in the presence of others with your God. Now, later on, we're going to see the parallel. And this is where God blows my mind. There's scripture that says that there is nothing new under the sun. And there is nothing new under the sun. But if we are sensitive to the word and if we are observant, always watching, we will begin to witness that there is nothing new under the sun. And even though we don't, we don't do sacrifices, Today. We don't offer sacrifices. We don't participate in that. We do in a different way. And so we're going to, we're going to get into that, but I want to talk about, I want to talk about peace and the fellowship offering and why gathering together as one body of believers, breaking bread, and um, participating, right? Participating in the offering, the burnt offering sacrifice. Why that's so important. And the reason why that's so important is because it's about, it's about wholeness and communion with God. It's about doing what's necessary, doing what's customary for the time that we live in, right? According to God's word, to partake or be accepted or um, experience relationship with God. So in Isaiah 26 verse 3, the word says, You will keep him in perfect peace 
whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And in Exodus 20 verses 24, the Lord says, you shall make an altar of the earth for me and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings your sheep and your oxen in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you, right? But when we think about things present day and how that applies to us present day, I hope the only thing that comes to your mind is Jesus. I hope the only thing when you think about sacrifice, when you think about peace, when you think about communion with the Lord, when you think about uh, fellowship, when you think about relationship, I hope the only thing that comes to your mind is Jesus. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later on, but Jesus, he paid it all. Jesus gave himself as the perfect sacrifice. And as we sit and we think about the common and customary practices of that time, I want you to ask yourself, would you be able to keep up with that? Would you be able to keep up with that lifestyle? Tending, rearing, raising all of your livestock, tending to your gardens, your grains, your vegetation, harvesting all of that, um, uh, taking care of your animals, and then taking the best of what you have and regularly give it to the Lord. Now we know our God is gracious and we know that our God supplies every need and we know that our God will never leave us or forsake us. And we know that the righteous of the Lord are not forsaken. We know all of these things, but it is still a sacrifice it is still a labor of love. It is still a lot to give and seemingly a lot to give often, right? Um, could you do that? Could you lead that lifestyle? When I look around at the people who exist in the world today, I, I don't know if we could. Could we rise to the occasion? I, I think that we could. Would we struggle? Yes. But because of Jesus, we will never have to do that. Because of Jesus, we will never have to do that. Because of Jesus, we have, we have so much. And I'm so excited um, to get into that. But what I will say as we are talking about peace offerings and offerings in general, is what the Lord said in John 14, 27 peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. If that's not loving, I don't know what is. If that is not the pinnacle of all assurances, I don't know what is. I don't know what is, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you as well as I, as well as every other person in this world have a way through Jesus and that is something to praise right all right let's talk about it how do we praise the Lord how do we praise the Lord our God do we praise the Lord our God by getting up and running around the sanctuary I mean if you are led in the spirit to do that let me put it this way if you are led by the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ to do that have your way but there are so many ways that we can praise the Lord. And so we are going to look at uh, verses 4 through 36 to examine that closely. The word of the Lord reads, That day, David first committed to Asaph and his associates the psalm of thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory is his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. 
O descendants of Israel, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, hallelujah. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. When they were but a few in number, few indeed and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation from kingdom to another. He allowed no man to oppress them. For their sake, he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise for he is to be feared above all gods. I'm gonna say that one again. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Hallelujah. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The earth is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest, excuse me. Then the trees of the forest will sing. They will sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God, our savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, that we may glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Ooh, wow. Am I the only person who could feel the power in that prayer? Am I the only person who could feel the praise in that psalm? We're going to break down what all David was saying in this psalm. He said a lot. So this psalm is entitled David's Psalm of Thanks. And there are several components that make up the way that he praised the Lord. And this is the guidance for us and how we should praise the Lord. It's also a reminder, a reminder because I know that us as believers, we have a tendency to be critical of ourselves. We have a tendency to um, not think that we're doing as much as we should, uh, not being fully aware of all that we are doing. And so it's important that we be reminded, okay? So let's delve into that. There are eight components here. And the first one that we're gonna look at is in First Chronicles, 16 verses 4 through, excuse me. Oh, let's start with. Yeah, we'll start there. Verses 4 through 6. So I'm going to read it. It says, He appointed, and we're talking about David, He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to make petition, to give thanks and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, Zechariah second, and then Jael, Shemariah, Jehiel, Mathathiah, I'm butchering it, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed, Edom, and Jael. They were to play the lyres and harps. Asaph was to sound the cymbals. 
and Benaniah and Jaziel, the priests, were to blow the trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. So what we see there is ministry in action. One of the ways that we praise the Lord is through our service. It's through our intercession and it's through our musical worship. Number two, we praise the Lord by remembering God and what he has done. So come with me now and let's look at 1 Chronicles 8. Excuse me, 1 Chronicles 16 verse 8. It says, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Many times in scripture, we are encouraged by many people in the Bible to remember God, but we are encouraged by no one more than God himself. Encouraged, reminded, and commanded to remember him. Remember him. And we do this by calling on his name and making known everywhere that we go what he has done for us. The third way that we praise the Lord is by adoring him. And that comes by the way of sitting in his presence. Let's look at verse 9 through 11. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. When we sit before the Lord, we begin to wonder. We begin to remember all the good that he has done. And we sit in awe-inspiring moments. We recall what the word says. We remember what the word says about you know, um, who God is, what his character is, what he looks like, what he's done. All of this is adoration. We long for him. We cry out to him. We utter things that are unspeakable and we do it in an inaudible way. Our heart cries, tears come out. We sit at his feet, oftentimes we are silent, unless we're not, maybe we're travailing. But it's, it is important to adore God, to look at him with eyes full of awe and sit before him in wonder. Number four, we praise the Lord our God through acknowledgement, acknowledging his character and his identity. Let's go down to verse, let's see here, verse 12. Let's do verses 12 through 17. So remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Israel, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all of the earth. He remembers his covenant before the word he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree to Israel, as an everlasting covenant. All up and through that, you hear his word, his covenant, his promise. Those are the details of God's character. Those are the details. We judge people in modern society today by their ability to give a word and stand by it, by their integrity, by how reliable they are. We worship God and we praise him. We praise him every time we acknowledge this aspect of his character. The fact that what he says comes to pass and his word does not return to him void concerning any issue that we would encounter, any problem, anything that we need. We know this about him and we can testify to it. Hallelujah. Number five, another way that we praise the Lord our God is by sharing the gospel of his existence and the mission. So let's look at verses 18 through 23 which read to you I will give the land of Canaan as portion as the portion you will inherit when they were but few in number few indeed and strangers in it they wandered from nation to nation 
from one kingdom to another. He allowed no man to oppress them. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Share the gospel. Tell people what God did for you. I want to pause here. How many of you believe or, or recognize that you're praising God when you do that? That you're praising God when you tell him those, those I like to call them God winks or God moments. You know, you're going about your day and then something happens and it seems like a coincidence or it seems like there is no way in the world things could have lined up in this perfect timing. There's no way in the world, right? Those God moments. When you share with them and a time maybe you were experiencing a extenuating circumstance, an insurmountable obstacle, and God saw you through, you are in that very moment praising the Lord and you are praising him in a way that only you could praise him. Glory be to God. Number six, we praise the Lord by testifying to the goodness of God. Let's look at verses 24 through 27. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Woo! You gotta testify. You gotta tell the truth about God. You got to say what you know. You got, it's our responsibility. And I believe, as most believers believe, that this is, this is what gets people to turn turning points. This is what gets people, this is what piques their interest. When you tell your story. Now, most people, and maybe I'm saying this, maybe I'm, maybe I'm right about this, maybe I'm not. But most people aren't going to tell you all their business. Most people aren't going to tell you all their business unless it's just one of those stories. It's like an amazing story that the focus of the conversation is not going to be the details of their business, but their, their, their miraculous experience in the story. And so when you get people to testify, it doesn't matter what you went through because the glory of the miracle that God and God alone produce out of that situation, the way that he made out of no way, that surpasses any shame or guilt or humiliation, whatever that, you know, a person may have experienced in their story. And when I say that, the word that comes to my mouth, the word that comes and, and you know, it comes from my heart, but it's coming through my mouth is that our God is so good that he takes what the enemy meant for harm and he makes it good. He takes what the enemy meant to destroy us, to kill or to steal from us and he makes it good. He makes it to profit us. He makes it to prosper us. He makes it to shape and to, to form us. David said, and I forget which Psalm it was, but bear with me. David said, oh, hallelujah, Father. Psalm 119, verse 71. Thank you, Jesus. David said, it was good for me to be afflicted because that's how he began to learn the word of, of God. That's how he came into knowing God. Hallelujah. We have to testify. All right. Number seven, we praise God by evangelizing. Oh, Lord Jesus, here we go. We praise God by evangelizing. Join me, verse 28 through 33. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. 
Let them, let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then the trees of the forest will sing. They will sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, the word of the Lord says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. So if we were going to condense everything that was said in those couple of verses, it would, it would, it would boil down to let everything, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And you know what I would add to that? Let even the things like the rock that Moses struck in the desert, <laughs> let that rock also praise the Lord because praise the Lord did it not, did that rock not produce water? <laughs> Glory to God, right? Under the authority of God. Oh my goodness, all things are possible. But this also points to evangelizing. Right? When we go out and we touch people, we invite them to come in, we're sharing the word of God. And then we invite them to partake, to experience it for themselves. Glory to God, look at, oh my goodness. And the final way that we praise the Lord, our God, is by witnessing. So we're gonna take a look at verses 34 through 36, which read, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God, our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, that we may glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Because when you have encountered God and you acknowledge that it was God and you testify to the truth, of that experience and you share it with others, um, hopefully it moves them or not, then you become a witness. Oh yes, you become a witness. You become somebody who knows. You become somebody who can't deny it. You, you become somebody who can't unsee what they saw. Look at that, holy, 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 holy Lord our God. You become somebody who can't unsee what they saw. You become someone who can't unexperience what they experienced. You become transformed and you are never the same. And when you get to that point, your praise, your praise, there's no telling. There's no telling the heights that, that your praise reaches when you get to that point. Glory to God, that was really good. So I am just gonna pause real quick and take a sip of this tea. Mm -mm -mm. And we are gonna keep going. So that's how we know that we praise. And why, why is this relevant? Well, I would say it's relevant for two reasons. Number one, we need to have an idea of what we're doing and why we're doing it. But uh, number two, we have to understand what we're going through as we go through it, right? And so if we can look at praise um, in this way, and we look at uh, David's Psalm of Thanks structured this way, it aids our understanding. It aids our understanding of exactly what's taking place. Now, last week we received the word in 2 Kings and it reminded us about God's provision. It warned us not to doubt his provision and goodness, even in the most desperate times. We learned about the role that our enemy plays in our uh, prosperity and blessing and deliverance, okay? And um, I would say in short, again, Whatever role the enemy is playing in our prosperity, blessing, and deliverance, God will make it for our good. And so lastly, we received instruction to pray Psalm 83 all week long, demonstrating our faith in the message of the Lord. And the reason why I mention that is I think the way that the Holy Spirit is guiding this study is very interesting. This week we focus on praise and understanding what praise is and how we do it, but most importantly, why we do it. 
So what does praise look like today? This is where we're going to transition a little bit. And let's join me, please. In John 12, verses 37 through 50, it is in this portion of scripture that we gain insight into the state of the world post Old Testament. And so I'm going to begin by reading the scripture here. Let's see. Bear with me. All right. So the scripture reads, Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. And so I think it's important to mention at this point um, what is going on, a little bit of pretext. Um, so Jesus, up to this point, has, has ministered. He's ministered to unbelieving people. He has been walking with his disciples. He has challenged uh, the Pharisees, and he has ministered before them. And um, he's done miraculous things. And he's reached a point where he is recognizing their unbelief. And so now we receive the word of the prophet Isaiah, which says, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So that's the prophecy that Isaiah released in his time during the Old Testament, referring to the time that Jesus in this text is now in. A time where they have seen the goodness of God, they have seen the miracles of God. So much so, I mean, Jesus proved pretty much, he put it in their face. He, you know, he, he, put, he put it all out there. Everything. Answered every question. He slayed every, every um, foundation for doubt. He did miracles. And he is literally justifying himself as the Messiah. And they still don't believe. So, verse, so picking up at verse 39, it goes on to say, For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. So what's happening here is the moment that Jesus is living through right now, it's kind of like a looking back and then being very present with what you're going through in the moment. And this scripture is looking back to what Isaiah said, what Isaiah prophesied. And what Jesus is currently experiencing is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Okay. So if we look at verse 41, it goes on to say, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved praise from men more than they loved praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into this world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. As for the person who hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak out of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. So I know that his, that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. This is really um, intense scripture. I believe that 
in this moment, Jesus is kind of, because he's in human form, Jesus is remembering, I, you know, I remember the prophecy of what the prophet Isaiah said, but I'm here in the flesh and I can't believe it. And I don't want to blaspheme the Lord or the Holy Spirit, but speaking as a human being who's reading the experience of God experiencing life as a human, that had to be what was going through his mind. He's remembering what the prophet said, and I behold the prophecy. I, I, I understand that this all had to happen, but to be before these people and having done all that I did and seeing that they still don't believe, it is incredible. It is incredible. And so then Jesus goes on to say, he cries out, you guys need to recognize what the game is. I, and this is the game, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. Why is that important? Because we know that the um, the Jews, uh, the um, the Jews, the Jewish people of the Old Testament, and I believe the Orthodox Jews of today do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They do not recognize. Jesus as the Messiah. The Pharisees did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And that is why, even though they believed, they believed this man is working the miracles that are consistent with the prophecies of the Old Testament. They believed and then some, some wouldn't believe. Jesus is trying to appeal to them and say, I am the Messiah, but this is how it works. I say what God tells me to say. He says that when you believe in me, you're not just believing in me, but you're believing in God as well. When you see me, you don't just see me, but you're seeing God as well. I came here as a light so that anyone who believes in me will stay out of the darkness. But, if, but this is what happens if you don't. If you're a person, you hear my words, you see my miracles, you're witnessing, but you know, but you don't keep the commands, um, then it's not gonna be me who judges you because I didn't come to judge the world. There is a judge, God is the judge. He's pretty much saying I'm an ambassador because he's speaking as a human being, but also as God. So we see Jesus is, I carry this awesome power, but I'm here to do this servant. I, I am God incarnate. I am the Messiah, but I came to serve the least of them, right? So this is the, this is the duality that we're seeing here. And I believe that this could have been the reason why the Jewish people had such a hard time accepting him right? Because Jesus was radical in every single way. So he goes on to say, um, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word, which I spoke will condemn him at his last days because I, it's not me speaking on my own accord, but I speak on behalf of the father who commanded me to say what I say and how to say it. Okay, because it's this command that leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the father has told me to say. We need to bear in mind that that's the, that's the atmosphere of this exchange and what's happening right now. But if we delve deeper, let's look at this piece by piece. Now this is Christ talking and we know that he is the perfect peace offering. Let's look again, keep in mind what you learned in the first three verses of 1 Chronicles 16, the setting. What was in the setting? The Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God came in first. And then you had people who were um, ministering and serving and um, uh, preparing the assembly, right, to receive the Lord. And then there was a breaking of the bread. So Christ, Christ embodied is the perfect peace offering. 
He is the human manifestation of God, and he is the example of the way that we should go. He's an embodiment of reconciliation, and those who believe in him will be reconciled in relationship to the Heavenly Father. That's the power of what's being stated here. The unstated statement is this, Israel messed up so many times. We couldn't, Israel couldn't get it right. And we couldn't stay right for long before we began to backslide. That's why I'm here. The peace offering, the peacemaker, the one who's going to reconcile you to the heavenly father. What you do to me, you do to him. That's the unstated statement, right? The problem is, Again, the Jewish people, the, the, the people of Israel and the believers, um, well, I'll just say the people of the present day, the people who are alive right now in 2022, don't believe. Right? There's a new standard. There's a new standard um, for what it takes to have a relationship with God as of the arrival with Christ. No longer do we need to commit sacrifices and burnt offerings and peace offerings as it were during that time. But the new standard as of the arrival of Christ who is the Messiah says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the problem that we're seeing here in the text, take a look at, let's see here, verse 42. Yet at the same time, even many, even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Jesus is, again, performing miracles before an unbelieving world. And we still witness those miracles today because the Lord is still at work through his Holy Spirit today. And he's doing this before an unbelieving and world-conformed people who do not acknowledge, remember, that's a part of praise, who do not acknowledge him, right? Now, let's break down what we're seeing in John 12, 42 through 43. And this is what we're seeing. Again, it says, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise of men more than they love praise of God. And if we go back to the example, first three verses in First Chronicle 16 that demonstrate the order for which we are to praise God. People come last. It was not the Ark of the Covenant that came in after the people. It was the Ark of the Covenant that came first. It was the Ark of the Covenant for which a space in a room um, was prepared for it to take up space. And the others, people, ministers, Levites, David came in and committed service as well as praise and, and peace offerings surrounding it. This is backwards. Right now, in this text, in the same way at this time in the world, People are prioritizing the praises from the world, broadly speaking, the praises from men more than they prioritize the love and the praise from God. Okay, so we've got a couple of symbols in here I want to break down. Pharisees, it symbolizes something. The Pharisees symbolize the predominant customs and societal norms of the time, the elites and the high-ranking authorities, otherwise known as the people in power. Okay, that's what the Pharisees symbolize. The synagogue, it symbolizes culture, 
society, provision, resource. It's starting to make sense now. How is it that a people who witness all of these miracles are hesitant to confess their belief? How is it that they, that, that, that that could happen? Well, guess what? There are, it's a thing called societal pressures and I'm not making an excuse for it, but we all live in this world and we have an understanding of what's going on there, but they're still in order and God still requires, um, he requires us to, to participate in relationship with him a certain way. Let's break down the praise of men, right? The praise of men present day equates to being positively regarded, rewarded, and supported or accepted by worldly standards. This is one of the main hindrances to faith in the modern age. Now the praise from God signifies being positively regarded, rewarded, supported, and accepted by the standards of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so we have to behold what the Lord said, um, you know, what the Lord commanded us in Exodus 20, verse three, thou shalt have no other gods before me because he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending. He who is, who was, and is to come, the almighty God, El Shaddai. So that's what's going on here. And now I'm going to switch the gears one more time. One more time. One more time. Hang in there with me. Because this is about to get good. <sighs> Join me in 2 Chronicles verses or chapter 20. Now, I think it's probably appropriate. I don't want to take up too much of your time. <laughs> but I think that it is appropriate to maybe paraphrase this story. I'm going to do my best to paraphrase, but I'm a thorough person. I just, you know, that's my disposition. All right, here we go. So I want to introduce to you the story of Jehoshaphat. And, and the time when he praised. And that praise led him to one of the greatest victories that he had seen in his time, that anyone had seen in his time. And I want for those of you who were able to join us, and if you weren't, you can always go back and check it out. Last week we talked about Second Kings, we looked at Second Kings verse seven, okay? And in that scripture, actually, you know what? Maybe it's better, let's go to the Psalms because I think that that gets right to it. But um, last week we looked at, yes, Second King chapter seven and um, we were led by the instruction of the Lord to pray Psalm 83 all week long. Now, this instruction was only given to those who attended the Bible study um, because it came via a prophetic word and a prophetic instruction. And so wanting to stay as close to that as possible, um, we wanting to stay as close to God's instruction as possible, that word was only um, shared that prophecy was only shared with those who attended the Bible study. Um, but I will share with you that as part of the prophecy, we were instructed to read Psalm 83. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is I want to list the enemies here in Psalm 83. And this is a song of Asaph. Now Asaph in first Chronicles chapter 16, he was one of the Levites who were ministering before the Ark of the Covenant. And Psalm 83, coincidentally, is a psalm that was written by Asaph. And in this psalm, 
he acknowledges various enemies of Israel. It starts with verse 5. This is Psalm 83. With one mind they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, with the people of Tyre, even Assyria has joined them to lend strength to the descendants of Lot. So as we look at 2 Chronicles 20, we understand that there that there is a triumph here and the triumph is over two of those tribes who were listed as enemies in Psalm 83. I found that to be profoundly significant, profoundly significant to enter into this week after having prayed last week. Every day, Psalm 83, which petitions the Lord for defeat of these foes. And this week, the Lord gives us his confirmation that it is done. And not only is it done, but it is done through, excuse me, it is done through praise. <laughs> I'm excited. So I kind of messed that up a little bit, but here we go. Now I might just have to read the whole thing because there's just a lot here. Um, here we go, I'm gonna read the whole thing. So, Second Chronicles chapter 20. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Men Mennonites came to make war with Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. He proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Now, it's important to note here that Jehoshaphat, at this point in time, is a king, a king of Israel. And he is using his authority to to assemble, to organize, and to get the people into formation. And one of the first things that he did was inquire of the Lord first. He inquired of the Lord first. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly, in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague of famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, that would be Edom, whose territory would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? Oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are acknowledging you. Our eyes are recognizing you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we remember what Jehoshaphat is saying, what Jehoshaphat is doing rather, is the same thing that David did in 1 Chronicles 16. And he did it with order. How is Jehoshaphat praising the Lord as he petitions the Lord? He, he already did the ministry. He's already organizing people. 
He, he, he organized the assembly of God. He made intercession through the fasting. But he remembered God and what he has done. He adored God. He came before his presence first. He acknowledged God, his character, and his identity. He's sharing the gospel, recalling everything about God's existence and his mission. Apportioning the land of Canaan as inheritance for the people. He's testifying on the goodness of God, all the while remembering what he did. Because this is the God who was, who is, and is to come. He's praising. He's praising. And he's standing as a witness. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Metaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. I want to pause right there. I want to pause right there. This is the Old Testament. And one of the men of Judah has just come forth and released the word, the command to do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. And when we look to the New Testament, John 14, verse 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. My friends, let us be reminded that there is nothing new under the sun and that our God is greater than any and every circumstance, every enemy, every foe, every threat, every delay, everything that exists. There is nothing new under the sun and our God is the same today as he was yesterday and as he will be tomorrow. The word of the Lord continues, for the battle, hallelujah, is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow's, tomorrow march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. I want to say something to the people who are going through right now. The people who have a need and you have done all that you can do. You've assembled all of your resources. You've done the fasting. You've removed what needed to be removed. You replaced it with what God instructed you to place it with. You have been praying. You have been interceding. You have been serving. You have been waiting. You have been adoring. You have been worshiping. And you have been, you have been praising. Okay? You have been doing. You have poured it all out. And there's nothing left to do. I want to tell you, as the Lord, I just, it's not me telling you. I just want to underscore this and reiterate it. Or restate it, excuse me. Take up your positions. Take up your positions. We're going to learn what those positions are. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Don't try to fix it yourself. Don't try to apply your own methods of resolution or what have you. Don't try to supply your own need. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. Why? Why? Because you've done all that you can do. And our Father, our Father, he, he will never leave us and forsake us. So face your problem. See it. Look it in the face. Look at that obstacle. Look at that mountain. Look at it. Go out and face it. But know that the Lord will be with you. And 
and that's hard. That's hard to bear when you're going through. That's hard to bear when you have needs. That's hard to bear when your circumstances and issues just seem to keep growing. That's hard to sit in. The word continues. Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Then some Levites, <clears throat> I guess I gotta roll it back there. After receiving the instruction to go out and face them tomorrow and the reassurance that the Lord would be with them, the first thing Jehoshaphat did was bow with his face to the ground and following his leadership, all of the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before God. Then it goes on to say that some Levites from the Kohathites and Korathites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Now the Levites, especially from the Kohathites and the Korathites, these are a people with a special gifting for praising, for singing. Present day, these would be the people who are, you know, these people in the church with these magnificent voices that bring you to tears and completely wreck you when you hear them sing. Just call them Kohathite and Korathites because that's, <laughs> that's their biblical lineage, okay? They have a special anointing for it. So anyway, these Korathites and Kohathites, they stood up as the rest of Judah and Jerusalem have fallen down in worship. They stand up and they worship and they praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Then early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him in the splendor of his holiness as they went out. At the head of the army, they said, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Imagine that. Jehoshaphat already told the Lord. He already told the Lord, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. And we don't know what to do, but we're looking at you. We're relying on you, Father. We're leaning on you, Father. We don't know what to do. We spent every resource. We've consulted every um, professional, every expert. Ah, we don't know what to do. <laughs> we've spent our last, we've done the most that we could do. And here they are going, walking in their faith, praising. Why? Because the praise, through their praise, they remember who God is and what God did for them. Through their praise, they are adoring, they are acknowledging, they are ministering to one another. They are keeping their spirits lifted. So as they begin to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. What happened there? It says, and this is the important part, as they began to sing and praise, no one said you had to do it beautifully. I can't sing. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes. Ah, they didn't, they, they probably didn't have nets. They didn't need to do it. They didn't have the strategy to do it. But God, the Lord sent ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab, their enemies. And Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, the Lord did it. And they were defeated. They were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. These are the miracles. 
These are the miracles that happen daily. This is the providence of God. This is the work of God. Verse 24 continues, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry, who? Oh, Jesus. Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder. I submit to you as we discussed last week, in 2 Kings chapter 7, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. The Lord is saying something to us here, people. Receive it. I read it again. This is verse 25, 2 Chronicles 20. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing. The Lord your God shall supply your needs. Oh, Lord, look it and also articles of value, more than they could take away. They received all of that. They received all of that. And they gave only, and they, they didn't have anything to give the Lord. So if we look at the Old Testament and, 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 and the customs of of praising God, of giving burnt sacrifice, excuse me, burnt offering and, and peace offering. They didn't even have that to give, but they gave their praise and they gave the best of what they had, which was only praise. And the Lord gave them more than what they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Bar Barakah, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the Valley of Barakah to this day. And let's take a look and see what Barakah means. Barakah means to praise. Verse 27, still in 2 Chronicles 20. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lutes and trumpets. The fear of God came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace. For his God, his God had given him rest on every side. My goodness. My goodness. That is beautiful. The message of today's scripture. Excuse me. The message of today's study is praise our worship and our weapon. And I hope that through the scriptures that we've studied, um, I hope that you will look at them independently and um, consider everything that you've learned here. You know, consider everything that you're going through and take in through your own study what's going on right now. Because not only is this a word for me, not only is this a word for you, but this is a word for the time that we are living in. This is a word for the people right now. Um, this has been an incredible word. And I just want to make, um, be intentional about um, just, re just reminding you. Let me just go back to it again and remind you what praise is. Praise is ministry. It is serving God. It's interceding for one another. It is, um, you know, offering musical worship and praise. It is, it is remembering God. Whether you remember it out loud and you're telling people about it or you're just remembering things in your heart. There is no one who knows the heart of man like God. It's adoring God. It is getting before him and being bare. Yes, being bare. Mm -hmm. being naked before him, pouring yourself out. 
Because when we tell God and we confide in God what we need, what we're going through, even though he already knows it, when he hears it from us, it's an act of worship. It's, it is the, one of the purest forms of acknowledgement. You know, we're teased for, um, oftentimes people, kids are teased for having imaginary friends or um, discouraged, right? from having an imaginary friend, which is how talking to yourself is acknowledged in the world. But, and I think, now this is just my personal opinion, I think because of that discouragement, it, it, it just adds a, adds a little bit of a hindrance because we judge ourselves when we get into these quiet spaces sometimes and have conversations with God. Or if we're on the road and we're talking to God and we're a little self-conscious because other cars around us can see us talking to something or someone, but there's nobody there. Don't let that be a stumbling block for you, right? It's a way of adoring God. Um, another way that we praise is by acknowledging God, his character and his identity. Um, then we share, we share the gospel. We talk about his existence. We remind people of his mission and we help people to identify that in their situation. This is relationship here, sharing a relationship with, with others, whether they're in the body of Christ or they're somebody who doesn't really know Christ and, you know, through, through our sharing, we bring them in. That's praise. We testify to the goodness of God. We tell people, hey, no, you see why I have this? You see why I overcame that? You see why that didn't take me out? It's because of God. Yes, and we are in the time when people are going to call goodness evil and evil goodness and so we've kind of got an uphill battle that we need to trek but just like jehoshaphat who had nothing we who are in this world the world itself regards that type of belief that type of faith that type of knowledge the world regards it as nothing but we are going to trek on because we know we know who we belong to we know who we're in we know who's for us and we know what he can do, right? So the last two, how we praise the Lord, we evangelize and we witness, we witness. We got to stand up. I believe that in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 19, when it talks about the Levites from the Kohathites and the Korathites stood up. And they praised the Lord, the God of Israel with a very loud voice. They could have been sitting down. But when you witness, you stand up and you make yourself known. I believe it is a way of setting, of setting, distinguishing yourself amongst the crowd. You are setting yourself apart. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When everybody else was bowing, they stood up. They stood up a witness. Oh my God, there's so much in this. Holy Spirit, I thank you in the name of Jesus for everything that you are doing and for, for all of the wisdom and knowledge that you are squeezing out right now. Brethren, I, I pray in the name of Jesus that you receive every one of these words. I am going to include in the comment section on our YouTube video here some resources. And I hope this week that you would focus on praising the Lord, that you would take a closer look at your day-to-day -day activities and just recognize for yourself the ways that you are praising the Lord. And if it's not enough for you, you'd like to do more, I hope and I pray that you would be intentional about doing it in a way that only you can do it. I am gonna include some worship songs that are a favorite, a favorite in this ministry. And it's a long list. I hope that you take your pick. I'm also going to include some resources that um, are just helpful because we talked about a lot of things that aren't, um, well, you know, they're very Old Testament. And so it just helps to build um, deeper knowledge in the things of God. So I'm going to include that as well. But as always, this time has been wonderful. And I hope that you take it all in. You take it all in. Now, 
I want you to like take a big gulp, but you know what? You, <laughs> you take it in the time and the manner that you need to take it. I thank you for tuning in. I think I have so much thanks, um, but I, I just thank the Holy Spirit for what he is doing. Anyway, I'm beginning to ramble. That is our broadcast for today. That's the message for today. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe. That is the way that um, really, in, in, at, you know, that's the way that we sow into this ministry. And that's the way that uh, evangelism is really happening in this day and age. So um, please be a participant in that. Okay, you all take care. Thanks for tuning in.